I'm not sure whether to spend my half hour arguing with Enrico's interpretation of Kos uh, or talking about Guido. But Kos had his birthday two years ago, so I think t for today we'll, we'll talk about Guido. This talk in the paper, which is actually a rather long paper, um, grows out of, out of a much larger project I'm working on, on the history of the Coase theorem, the development uh, in the literatures of economics and law, the controversies over the theorem, the use made of the theorem, and so on. And, and the project is much less about what Ronald said, uh, on which I've written extensively in the past, than about what people have done with uh, the idea. And one of the things that emerges from this, and, and it's front and center in, in Guido's treatment of, of Coase's ideas and in what others have made of Guido's treatment of Coase's ideas, is that in some sense there is no Coase theorem or that the Coase theorem is a, at least a very organic enterprise. Um, it was never sort of set down from on high and it came to mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And Guido's work is in many ways um, emblematic of that. And, and all of this originates in some thoughts on risk distribution in the law of torts which is um, a fascinating paper in a lot of different ways, as different people are pointing out uh, during our discussions here. Um, from my own perspective, about 80% of the paper I don't care that much about, no offense intended. Like, like, like Ronald Coase, I, I'm not so interested in, in law in and of itself. Um, my, my interest is much more instrumental, and it has to do with things that you know, sort of smell like Coase theorems. Um, and, and here's what Guido says uh, at one point in the article in, in asking whether economics can be of any use to us in dealing with uh, risky situations, uh, central problems of tort law. Uh, and I won't read the quotes to you. You can read, uh, read them yourself. But the conclusion that Guido comes to is that economic analysis tells us that it doesn't really matter to whom we assign liability in these interesting accident cases that no matter uh, to which party it's assigned, we're going to get the same result in either case. So economics is, is in some ways of no use to the lawyer, at least as traditionally conceived. Okay? And then, of course, Guido pulls back and says, well, I like economics, but economics is wrong. Okay? The traditional story is not an accurate story because there's all kinds of problems with the way things are worked out through the market. And so we need to be thinking in terms of who is the least cost avoider and all of that. And that sort of launched Guido down his, his economic analysis of law. Now, when you read this uh, in a very casual way, it, your, your first thought is, my god, Guido Calabresi invented the Coase theorem. Um, because this article, as has been said, was published roughly the same time as Coase's. Coase's article was not published in 1960. It bears a 60 publication date. It actually came out in the spring of 61 because Aaron Director and the Journal of Law and Economics were perpetually running behind. So these were basically simultaneous publications. Um, so, so one could argue that Guido invented the Coase theorem, except that the best evidence against that is Guido himself, who argued in his own paper that he is not the guy who came up with this idea. That this is an idea, and, and he's exactly right, that goes back in economics to the early 20th century. Uh, and one could argue it goes back to Adam Smith and even further to William Petty in the idea of compensating differentials. But, but this idea that, that uh, market outcomes are independent of rights uh, first arose in a specific way in workman's compensation. You find it in Frank Tausig. You find it in, in Harry Gunnison and Brown and, and other places. And it was very much a, a received view by the time Guido talked about it, and, and he made this very explicit. He also made explicit he thought that the economists were wrong. But so it, there, there's a sense then in which this supposed Coase theorem idea that law doesn't matter actually goes back at least 50 years before Coase talked about it in the problem of social cost. Well, the question then is, is why does that matter? Well, the reason it matters is because, well, I shouldn't say because, I'll get to because in a minute. The reason it matters really came out a few years later when Guido penned two uh, incredibly interesting articles. For, for my money, at least, they're more interesting than uh, the 1961 piece, but again, that may reflect my own weird idiosyncrasies. Um, what, one of those was the decision for accidents, published in 65, and the second one, which is even more fun, uh, is The Wonderful World of Bloom and Calvin, which was also published in 1965, and a critique 
critique of Bloom and Calvin's public law perspectives on a private law problem, which was published in 64 and was uh, in, in many ways an attack on Calabresi's approach to thinking about uh, accident law. In these 1965 pieces, Calabresi tells us in what he was talking about in 1961 when he, he brought out this sort of Coase theorem-like idea and relates it to Coase's own work and differentiates it, and that's, that's sort of the crucial point. Um, in, in 65, what Calabresi tells us is that what makes things go in, his, in, the, in the quotes we're talking about here, that it makes no difference, is the idea that parties are involved in, in what one might call a pre-existing bargaining relationship. Guido called it the bargaining case. And, and, I, and that, so that smells a lot like Ronald Coase, so let me differentiate it from Coase by calling it the pre-existing bargaining case. Like in the situation of products liability. With a product, you've got buyers and sellers in a market relationship, and so when there's some sort of externality that exists between the parties, there's already then a market relationship that can transfer the relevant costs into price once liability is established. Okay? And so that's why w w when Guido was writing in 61, he referred to things like workman's comp, products liability. In, in the labor market of workman's comp in the products liability case, there is this existing bargaining relationship. Right? The problem, as he showed in 61, is that the imperfections of the market tend to keep the liability-related cost assignments from being transferred appropriately into prices unless liability is assigned in the right way in the first place, that is, to the least cost avoider. In bringing Coase into the whole tort law picture, what Guido argued is that Coase's analysis complemented this earlier analysis. The earlier analysis showed that you get this nice, in theory, efficient and invariant outcome when you've got a pre-existing bargaining relationship. What Coase had shown, Calabresi said, completely correctly, is that even when parties aren't involved in a pre-existing bargaining relationship, you can get the same sort of efficient and invariant results through a market-like process, at least in theory. So polluters over here and victims over here, there's, there's no necessary relationship between them, but the assignment of liability creates the incentives to develop a market-like relationship, again, in theory, in a world of no transaction costs and all of that, that will efficiently and invariantly resolve the problem. Now the problem, Calabresi said, is that Coase's analysis, though, although beautiful, has even more difficulties associated with it than the pre-existing bargaining case. And he pointed to two things. The first of them is that there's a cost to establishing the market. Now that cost doesn't exist in the pre-existing bargaining situation because there the market is already present. So those costs are no barrier to getting the efficient and invariant outcome. There are other issues, but that's a different story. The second is that what, what Guido calls the freeloader problem, which I like, I like that term a lot better than free rider, which economists, and you use at times as well, but the freeloader problem. And that, of course, is the idea that in these large numbers contexts, when you have an externality, People have the incentive, the you know, victims trying to get together to bargain with the, the polluter or whatever, have an incentive to free ride on the efforts of others because they'll get all the benefit from the negotiated solution without having to bury any of the, any of the costs. And of course that causes the whole negotiation system to break down in the first place. So for those reasons, Guido said, we are unlikely to get uh, the type of uh, negotiated solutions or market solutions that Coase had envisioned in the independent parties situation. Now all of this brings us to what's actually an enormous point of departure between Calabresi and Coase. If you want to talk about you know, what Coase really said versus what Guido said, um, less interesting than maybe just sort of these different ways or different problems being examined by the two of them. In the Coase case, of course, what you're dealing with uh, consistently is small numbers bargaining. Uh, usually it's bilateral, the farmer and the cattle rancher. Uh, the, the confectioner and the physician uh, and so on in the legal cases that Coase is dealing with. In Guido's analysis, what we're talking about is classes of agents, injurers and victims. Not an injurer and, an, and a victim, but injurers and victims. And so that explains why Guido is focusing on things like the cost of establishing the market and the freeloader problem, none of which exist in the simple two-party bargaining models of Coase. 
Because if, if Ilan and I, you know, if, if I'm playing my stereo too loud in, in the hotel room next to Ilan, Ilan simply needs to walk over to me and bang on my door and, you know, we can begin, he can begin trying to pay me off to turn the stereo down. There's no significant cost there of establishing a market. When you have a million pedestrians in New York City and a million drivers in New York City, the cost of establishing a market between those classes of agents is astronomical. I mean, you could do the math in your head, right, of all the different things that have to be brought together, and so there it becomes an issue where it's not for COS. Likewise, in COS's system, free riding is no problem. When the farmer is bargaining with a cattle rancher, Who's he going to free ride off of, right? There, there are just simply individual agents. And so what Calabresi did was took Coase's analysis and laid it into a large numbers context. Okay? And, and that, in fact, is what a, many people have done over the years, and it's part of what gave rise to things like um, Coase as the basis for marketable pollution permits and so on, uh, that, that large numbers thing. But it, it took Coase's analysis in a very different direction than Coase himself had because in Guido's mind, that, that conceptualizing the appropriate legal rules involves dealing with these large number situations. Okay? Now, in spite of the fact that Calabresi rejected the applicability of Coase's analysis to most legal situations, he did so with amazing regret. Uh, and it's, it's very interesting to read his, his uh, almost laments about the fact that COSA stuff isn't more applicable. Because if it were, he said, you could take criteria like the least cost avoider and actually have confidence that these things would work out, work themselves out appropriately, efficiently in the legal realm. Because for, for Guido, what COSA had done is shown how an assignment of liability can be translated into costs and prices through, sorry, I don't know what's going on here. How the assignment of liability can be translated into costs and prices in these situations where you have independent agents. But alas, of course, the cost of setting up the market and so on get in the way. Now, Guido's also the first person to show that the Coase theorem doesn't work. Okay? Guido, has, Guido has a lovely 1965 critique based on entry and exit problems that what happens is that the assignment of liability increases profits in certain industries, decreases profits in other industries, and so you get these very nice entry and exit effects that cause differential outcomes across alternative assignments of liability. And uh, this is a very nice illustration of the sort of the market-oriented framework. Again, in Coase's own analysis, you wouldn't get those entry and exit effects because you're just dealing with individual parties. But Calabresi gave us what many would consider the first effective refutation of the Coase theorem. But Calabresi also gave us the first effective undoing of a refutation of the Coase theorem, for lack of a better term. And if you want to understand what the Coase theorem is really all about, there may be no better piece of literature to read than Guido's little 1968 article in the Journal of Law and Economics, Transaction Costs, Resource Allocation, uh, and liability, right? A comment. Okay? And it's a, it's a very little piece. It's incredibly well done. Uh, but more importantly, it shows a depth of insight into what Coase was on about in the negotiation analysis and for the implications of the negotiation analysis that you will find in precious few other places in the literature, either uh, in terms of stuff being written by Coase theorem supporters, the true believers, or Coase theorem opponents. And what Guido did here, what he was doing was retracting his own earlier criticism of the Coase theorem because once it was sort of the light bulb went on in terms of what all this really implies, he realized very quickly that his 1965 critique was incorrect. And so the brilliance of this is that in, there's, a, there's a, a method to Guido's madness here and there's a message in his method. The, the brilliance of Guido's analysis here is that he uses the Coase theorem to prove that the Coase theorem's right. That is, well, you, you, you've got the quote there, that the, if you've got any efficiency, market transactions will take place to cure it. That is, if the entry and exit effects that he talked about in 65 gave rise to an inefficient outcome, we'd simply get another round of Coasean negotiation that would correct that inefficiency. And so, in fact, it is true that all is for the best and the best of all possible worlds. In fact, Guido said, Coase's result sort of undersells itself. 
That is, it's not simply about the sort of externality related social cost issues that Coase was pointed at. In fact, Coase's analysis applies he says, to all market failures, public goods, monopoly, externalities, you name it. Whenever there is an efficiency, in a world of zero transaction costs, agents will have an incentive to, and thus will, undertake the negotiations necessary to correct those inefficiencies. So in fact, what you've got here is indeed a very, very wonderful world, but a world that's in fact tautological, because what the Coase theorem is, Guido essentially said, is simply another way of stating the criterion for Pareto efficiency. A Pareto inefficient position is one where what? The outcome can be improved by bargains. And of course, the Coase theorem says that those bargains will take place as long as there, is, uh, there are gains from trade available, at least if you want to think about Coase in, in a Paradian context. And so the Coase theorem is nice, it's true, but it's also completely tautological. Uh, and, and this is a criticism that's since been repeated by any number of people, uh, usually in the sense of, well, this is devastating to Coase and now we don't need to think about Coase anymore, uh, whereas Guido took just the opposite message. Because for him, in many ways, it made the Coase theorem far more important than he had considered it in 1965. And I, I don't know if this is what was in his head at the time, but it's what emerges from his writings. I mean, in 65, the Coase theorem, or the, the negotiation result, it hadn't yet been labeled a theorem by Stigler, was this nice little result that showed you could get a particular result in law under certain assumed conditions that don't necessarily fit in the real world. So it's, it, it's, it's cool, it's neat, but it's not tremendously helpful, although I wish it was. That's Calabresi 65. Calabresi 68 uh, in particular and beyond has a much more broad-based view of how the Coase theorem can be used to inform law and, and one could look at it as, in Calabresi's mind, giving us something of a benchmark and doing so in several ways. And, and these three ways here basically reflect the avenues that Calabresi's Coase theorem discussion, and there are 17 articles total where he uses it in one way or another, plus uh, assorted books um, over the, the next 25 years or so, the, the ways that Calabresi made use of the theorem. A, a, and the first is that it gives us a way of thinking about legal issues. And if you read the, if you read the 1960 one in 65 stuff, and then you read the cost of accidents, you see a, a, a real spin, a, 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 as in a 180 degree spin, in the way that Calabresi handles Coase's result. Right? His earlier work took the old story of the, the market-oriented cases, sort of what economics had to say, and oh yeah, and Coase said this other thing that's really potentially neat too. By the time we get to 1970, the Coase framework has become the basis for the market analysis of accident or tort law problems. And the, the pre-existing bargaining case is simply a special case of the, of the Coase theorem. Okay, so, so Coase's analysis becomes this much larger vehicle for thinking about law in a market-oriented context. Secondly, Guido used the Coase theorem as a guide for making efficiency assessments. Okay? And, and this takes different forms. Uh, some of them have to do with critiquing things like fault. Okay? For, for the fault system to be efficient, we would have to live in this amazingly wonderful world of the Coase theorem, for example. And, and so it, it's a device that he can use to expose the inefficiencies of particular legal rules. Uh, he also uses it to, to criticize other people. Um, in, in particular, there's a, there's a nice, um, ironically, uh, criticism of Posner, where, and this is one of two instances where Guido actually uses the Coase theorem to attack Chicago law and economics, which is an interesting way of making use of, of Coase. You shouldn't have to educate Chicago people on the implications of the Coase theorem for their own analysis, but, but Guido was compelled to do so on a couple of different occasions. But most importantly, perhaps, the Coase theorem provides a, a guide for making efficiency judgments, that is, for the normative side of law and economics. And in particular, Guido's the guy who gave us the mimic the market criterion, although a lot of people want to uh, lay that on Posner. But in fact, it was Guido in 68 who first laid this out explicitly, and he grounded this in the Coase theorem and continued to do so uh, in, in other places as he made related arguments over time. So for Guido, the theorem was a tautology, but it was an incredibly useful one, uh, one that had important implications for legal economic analysis. How long do I have, Alon? Ten minutes? Oh, we're, uh, Guido says, go on. You're saying nice things about me. Please carry on. I, I feel the same way, Guido. So.
happy to do so. But if you want to say nice things about me, I'll sit down and let you talk. All right. So, nice in theory, but what about the real world? Is for Calabresi the Coase theorem of, of any use? And the first answer to that is, is sort of no, in the sense that if you, if you take the Coase theorem literally, we don't live in a zero transaction cost world, so the Coase theorem is of little use. But Calabresi, unlike a lot of people, consistently, at least after 1968, showed a propensity to differentiate between what might, one might call the Coase theorem, on the one hand, or Coase's, the, the hard-nosed version of Coase's negotiation result, and the larger message of the problem of social cost on the other. And, and this, is the, this is the latter that we're really talking about here. That is, Calabresi was of the mind that the types of mechanisms contemplated by the Coase theorem, the, the ability of parties to, through a market-like process, through negotiation, whatever you want to call it, move to a more efficient position, is in fact often possible in the real world, and thus the, the possibilities for that need to be taken into account in formulating legal rules or thinking about the impact of legal rules or whatever the case may be. And he gives a number of examples of, of Coasean successes. One of, one of them is products liability sort of situations where now he is taking that bargaining case again and sort of subsuming it under the Coase theorem. Um, but more importantly, uh, you know, two other things that, that reflect more of a direct negotiation thing. The first is overcoming judicial error. That is, there are times, Calabresi said, and this is a theme that recurs through his writings, when we have to be extremely concerned about you know, what, what happens if we don't correctly discern who is the least cost avoider? How badly have we screwed things up? And, you know, what kinds of things can we use to help mitigate the potential effects of that? And he, this is one of the er areas where he drew on Coase. Because he said Coase tells us, indirectly or by implication, that there's this sort of natural error correcting mechanism out there. That if judges make mistakes and fail to assign rights to the least cost avoider, we can have some confidence that at least if they screw up badly enough, there will be an incentive for the parties to negotiate revisions to the situation, even if transaction costs are significant. That is, if the error, if, if the error is more egregious than the level of transaction costs, there's an incentive to negotiate a, a revised situation that will actually make the end result less inefficient or more efficient, depending on your perspective, than we would have ended up in otherwise. So we can, we can take some comfort in that. But the second piece of this is, uh, is what has come to be known in the literature as the normative Coase theorem. And it's, it's really Cooter and Ulan who, who sort of got this term going out there. But the idea originates in Guido's work, again, in the late 1960s. And that is that we can assign rights in a way that facilitates bargaining. This, this is not mimic the market. Assign rights according to how the Coase theorem result would uh, sort of play itself out if we actually lived in a zero transaction cost world. This is one of those, we don't necessarily know what's efficient, but we do know that party B could take steps to initiate negotiation more simply than can party A, so let's assign rights to party B. That way if we screw up, there's a good chance that some bargaining will take place. So for example, if you have uh, uh, a, a class of victims that's enormous and a class of injurers that's small, you would not want to assign rights in such a way that that large class of victims was forced to initiate negotiation because it'll be very difficult to get those large numbers of people together. Rather, assign rights in a way that induces the, in the say, the polluter, the injurer, to initiate negotiation, and that way you've got a greater chance of negotiation occurring. And that's the, the earliest version of the normative Coase theorem. The other interesting aspect of Guido's real-world treatment of the Coase theorem is how he takes on the, what, what I like to call the true believers. That is, the people who actually believe that we live in one of these strange Coase theorem worlds. Uh, these are usually people, uh, at least in Guido's mind, associated with the Chicago School. Um, and, and there's some very nice critiques of Stigler out there that are worth reading within, within Guido's work. But what's important that comes out of this is Guido's understanding of the implications of the Coase theorem. The Coase theorem tells us that in a world without transaction costs, markets behave perfectly. As Guido pointed out, in a world without transaction costs, government is also perfect. <laughs> 
So the Coase theorem gives us no re and, and actually, Guido is not original with this. Coase basically said the same thing in the problem of social cost, but nobody paid any attention to it, right? Uh, either, either the opponents or the, the, the true believers. None of them paid any attention to it. I don't know if anybody's paid any more attention to you, but if people say it enough, maybe somebody will start to understand. Right? But, uh, and, the, you know, th th this cuts both ways. Uh, so that is, the message that comes out of this for Calabresi is in some sense that the Chicago people are nuts in, in thinking that the Coase theorem tells us that the market's the right way to go because in a Coase theorem world, the government's just as good as the market. On the other hand, he said, those who favor uh, non-market remedies, as Guido calls them, that is, the, the, the sort of pro-government intervention types, are just as nuts as the Chicago people because if you believe that markets are imperfect, then you also have to accept the corollary assumption that government is imperfect and costly. And so there, there's no a priori reason to privilege any of this stuff. All right, getting close to the end. Um, Italian conspiracy. I won't spend a lot of time on this because it gets a little, it's, it's in the paper, it gets a little dry, boring, and complex. But one of the things we see in Guido's work over time, at least as respects the Coase theorem and related bits, is that he went from being a Calder Hicks, minimized cost sort of guy, to becoming a Paradian. Okay? And one of the things that Guido realized is that the Pareto criterion and the Coase theorem bear interesting similarities and that if one lays the Pareto criterion onto the Coase theorem, you get this wonderful, you know, sort of tautological version of the theorem. What Guido pointed out in 1991, though, is that the Coase theorem doesn't need to assume zero transaction costs. In fact, in any world, if one adopts a Paradian definition of efficiency, parties will negotiate to an efficient solution absent transaction costs. So the Calabresi version of the Coase theorem in the I won't say the older Calabresi, I don't want to, in the later Calabresi, shall we say, is that the Coase theorem is this much more general proposition that applies to all states of the world. So what comes out of that, though, and this is something that you find in bits of Harold Demsetz in different contexts in Jim Buchanan, is that what is is efficient. Okay? And the interesting implication of that, of course, is that it sort of takes efficiency out of the picture. Every result can be presumed to be efficient, and so that takes us into the world of distributional analysis. And so in a weird way, this Coase theorem idea, which is in the hands of Chicago people at least, an idea that says, eh, it's all about efficiency. For Guido, became an idea that's actually all about distribution. And in fact, this makes perfect sense. And one of the things that almost nobody discusses, the only person who raises this in the literature is a guy who's very famous in Australia, but not anywhere else, a guy named Ralph Parrish, who was an Australian environmental economist back in the 1970s. And what Parrish said, and he's, exa is he, and he's exactly right, is that, this is paraphrasing, the Coase theorem should be the distributional theorist's best friend. Because while Chicago tells us that it doesn't matter how we assign rights, we're going to get efficiency anyway. To, an, to a distribution theorist, what the Coase theorem says is, hey, we can assign rights however we want, including indulging our distributional preferences, and we'll get an efficient result anyway. There's no leaky bucket. The best of all possible worlds. So, you know, so, the, so the, the, the Larry Tribes and the Mort Horowitzes and the Duncan Kennedys of the world should be embracing the Coase theorem rather than arguing against it because it's the best weapon they ever had for indulging their ideological predilections. Right? And, and Guido puts this out there four square in the pointlessness of Pareto, but in fact, he says, the same is true in a world of positive transaction costs because any result is efficient, and so what we can do is just go to the distributional side and figure out what we want to do from that perspective. All right, it's about time to wind up. I'm going to leave you with this quote. I'll just leave it up there for you to read. But it, it very nice, and this is actually from the end, uh, this is from the, 19, or the 2005 paper, Neologisms Revisited. It's a very nice view of, in some ways, Calabresi's methodology of law, if you want to put it that way, and, and why the, the, the model building nature of law and economics has something useful to say to law in spite of the unrealism of the models. It also very nicely captures, I think, the perspective with which he approached the Koch theorem and the fact that, and, and why in various ways he found it useful for his analysis. Now I'll stop there, thanks.
So that uh, uh, it's not a very important <coughs> Portuguese at all. That's the first half. The second point is on the question of the non bargaining states, I've often wondered, I'm not sure whether the footnote and the thing that was taken out of risk uh, some thoughts uh, about is it a About is it, oops, sorry, uh, about is it a, a cost of a driver or a cost of uh, the pedestrian, whether that wasn't, in fact, already presaging that side of the Coase theorem. That is, that that was not just a reciprocity of cause, but it was also a suggestion of the relevance to a non bargaining case. Well, the answer to that is that we have to see the original footnote, but you can't. I can't version. find the original version. It is somewhere in my papers at Yale, and it will turn up, but I haven't been able to find it yet. That is the nature of the anarchy that is Yale. It will turn up. Um, now, uh, on markets and governments, and the fact that each may work better, and each perfectly works perfectly, of course, that is simply the early Coase and the late Coase. Coase, in the nature of the firm, was telling us that markets are costly and that command, interestingly, because that's something, and it's something I'm writing on now, command doesn't mean government, it means different types of command. There's private command as well as public command, and they're different, and their costs are different, just as there are different types of markets. There are money markets and non-money markets. And which is the better one if we take Coase in this Calabrian sense, perhaps, but Coase at the beginning was saying that. I've teased Coase to say he saw the costs of markets and the advantages of government in the 1920s when he was a socialist. He saw the costs of government and the advantages of markets in the 1960s when he was a libertarian. But it's all there. They both cost, and the question is, which costs most in what circumstances? As to normative costs, uh, notice the similarity between the statement, put it on the best negotiator, the person who can enter into transactions, and that comment I made earlier today to Enrico's paper when I was talking about the generic free enterprise structure with limited liability as being a non-fault liability world. And I said the reason we have limited liability is because there are situations in which banks can blow the whistle, the creditor can pull it down. That's the same thing as saying they are a better negotiator in that time. And finally, and important, I do not believe that what I said in the pointlessness of Pareto uh, makes efficiency irrelevant and only distribution. What it says is that there's no difference between moving to the Pareto frontier and moving the Pareto frontier. But moving the Pareto frontier does have efficiency consequences. It can make more people better off than others. Because of transaction costs and their universality, there is no theoretical difference between the two. But in moving, we must take into account whether it makes the pie larger as well as what the distribution. Distribution is essential. It cannot be avoided because it is always there, but that doesn't mean that making the pie larger, what we call efficiency, isn't there too. And so that the rather simplistic Australian version or the way that the Kennedys of this world might take it is reductionist because it ignores the fact what I said yesterday, that waste is not desirable. <laughs> that if you can make the pie larger with whatever distributional goals you have, that is better. But again, wonderful with those comments. Thank you. Thank you.
So, are there other questions or remarks? None? Any one of you wants to add something, Steve, Enrico? A question perhaps to Steve Medema. No, one, I was just wondering if you have any positive theory why Gauss theorem caused so much, perhaps most, fuss and also, say, confusion than many other building blocks of economics in the sense that, you know, Gauss theorem is just one of so many uh, models where, you know, economists just create a very abstract, admitted unrealistic world with extreme assumptions that are not really applicable in the real world, but it serves this great function of, you know, looking what the world is, looks like, and then when we make up some other models that are closer to reality, we have to think very carefully what is the source of market imperfection, what is the particular source of transaction costs, and so on. So we have the supply and demand model, which is also useful to you know, explain some phenomena and totally useless to explain others, the rational expectations, the real business cycles in macro and so on. And like, economists are perfectly comfortable with those and knowing their limitations, but there was something about the Gauss theorem that just caused this all confusion and essentially 20, maybe 30 years of discussion about what it really means and whether it is useful as a model or whether it describes the world or not. What makes it so different? Is it that because there's no math in it, so even the lawyers could read it and therefore misunderstand it? I don't know. We don't have enough time to answer that question if people want to get lunch. Um, th that is, it's a very complex answer. I think part of it, though, is, and you're exactly right, the pair, I mean, Modigliani Miller has been called the special case of the Coase theorem, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, it, 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 as have a, a number of other people. And they're, they're, the parallels between rational expectations macro and the Coase theorem are, you know, uh, not insignificant either. Um, and not that the other things weren't controversial, but there hasn't been this 6,000 journal article literature firestorm, right, like there has with the Coase theorem. Um, I think that part of it has to do with the period in which the Coase theorem arose and what was going on then. Um, the 1960s was a period of increasing environmental awareness. Environmental economics was just getting off the ground during this period. Um, really got rolling in the 70s, okay? But by the time you got to the early 1970s, there were people running all over economics departments in the United States saying, we don't need the Clean Air Act. The Coase theorem tells us that the market will solve all these problems. Now, you can search high and low in the journal literature, and you won't find anybody putting that into print. I mean, it's asinine, right? But yet people were saying it. And, I, and I, there, if you talk to the old duffers in environmental economics who were around then, and the people who were in environmental economics in the early 70s were pro-environmental you know, pro correction people, right? They weren't the free market types. The, the, the people were saying this like crazy. And so that's why I think that's part, that's one piece of the much more complex story of why you get this massive pushback, okay? In, in other areas, um, or on the theoretical side, you have this incredibly entrenched Pigovian view. There had been nothing in the way of significant challenge to the Pigovian view since Pigou first laid it out. It had been beautifully formalized and all of that during the 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, this is how you need to deal with externalities. There, there's no way around it. Modigliani Miller rational expectations didn't face a formidable opponent like that. You say, well, what about Keynesian economics? Well, Keynesian economics had been discredited, right? The Pigovian system was very much in its ascendancy. Um, and lastly, the Coase theorem is so incredibly counterintuitive. I mean, it's, lo it's logically obvious, but, it, it, but in terms of economist priors, completely counterintuitive. Markets can't solve these problems, okay? I mean, Coase very much made a career of doing the counterintuitive. The Lighthouse article is another great example of that, but there, there, there are others. Um, but, but the challenge that it posed to receive thinking was more significant than many, many other ideas during 20th century economics, and I think that as much as anything uh, accounts for the issue. Guido can speak to the legal well, side in particular. Um, I, I think that one of the, uh, first I think uh, one is unfair to Coase to think that Coase meant one doesn't need to do anything. Right. One has to read Coase, the problem of social cost, in the light of Coase, the nature of the firm. Coase was saying all the time 
Markets have costs and command has costs and let's look to what they are. Uh, that was what Coe said. But Coe didn't say much. He said that. Stigler and the Chicago people picked that up as an excuse for abstention from any intervention at any time. And that became the popular thing that Medina said among economists. Among lawyers, it broke into any number of other ways, which I think are much more interesting. But in the end, you know, what Coase did was to take things like Modigliani Miller, Mead had done the same thing in international trade, someone else whom I've forgotten did it somewhere else, and generalized it and said what I've said was the equivalent in micro of Say's Law. That is, that you didn't need to do anything under conditions which weren't there, but conditions are there, and therefore you have to decide when it is worthwhile doing something and when it is not. And that's what today survives. During that time, different people tried to grab onto this person and this theory for their own uses, the much more interesting work is the one which is done today, which says empirically, when does one work and when does one another? That's why I like Viscusi's work so much, even when I disagree with it, because it is based, which is most of the time, <laughs> but uh, uh, because it is based on empirical judgments as to when one will work and when one doesn't, which is really what the thing is about. Two more bits to that. One, going off what Guido said, is that nobody read past page eight. It, it, it's a 44-page article, and if you actually read it through to the end, you find out that all of Coase's analysis beyond the first eight pages is about a real world of positive transaction costs, and that the first eight pages are simply a Pigovian world fiction, right, to show that Pigovian remedies aren't necessary. And also, uh, to get to what Enrico was saying earlier, Coase talks a lot about values at the end. Uh, that is, that it's not just about wealth. Um, and the other piece, to, to grant something that you said is, is incredibly important, you talked about the assumptions, right, and the mathematical modeling and all of that. Um, one of the problems with Coase's work and one of its beauties is he never made assumptions. He makes no behavioral assumption. He makes no environmental He doesn't assume perfect competition. He doesn't assume rationality. He doesn't assume anything except the absence of transaction costs and some assignment of property rights. As you said yesterday, he doesn't assume either Pareto or Calder Hayes. Right. Sorry, I think that uh, Enrico wants to say something. If I may. Well, Coase, once again, uh, recently uh, he repeated that people have been overemphasizing his first pages, uh, the tautologies, basically. Of course, if you say voluntary transactions in a zero transaction cost world bring about the results you would have with voluntary transactions you're not adding much to knowledge, you're just repeating. This is the Cosian tautology. So forget about the first part, which is useless. Go to the second part. What does he say? Virtually nothing. Because he says, well, you know, if we are in a zero transaction cost world, maybe we should do something to fix it. But I'm not really sure that the judge can fix it. Maybe he can, but they can make mistakes. Surely there is a role and a room for government intervention, however, we should not trust bureaucrats too much. And on top of it, but two lines I think it was, I said, we must think that uh, there are values to respect that people, when you take away their property rights, he didn't say that, but uh, I hope he meant it. Uh, <laughs> people might resent their, your encroaching upon their property rights. So the bottom line is, well, when we have market failures, quote-unquote, I don't really know what to do. Um, which is also reveals a deep misunderstanding of the market process. Market is not about outcomes. Market is about, that is, the raging markets, and, you know, they're just a bunch of people who believe that the world works according to the raging equilibria, or that the world should work according to the raging equilibria. Uh, markets is about voluntary exchange. It doesn't make, the market does not say 
that you come up with desirable results. The market process merely says that you come up with the results that people have voluntarily engaged in, period. When he claims in 37 that the firm is not the result of a market, that's false. That's wrong. When I hire a worker or I buy capital service, that is a market transaction. You cannot say that when, once I hire a worker, I am outside of the market. It's a purchase, voluntary exchange, labor services against purchasing power. That's not command, that's not planning. This cooperation, and uh, you enhance cooperation through market exchanges. So what is the story about uh, the firm is not a market? Of course it is. You just gave an incredibly elegant defense of Richard Posner, and I'll explain why at lunch. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, so I think that we uh, deserve a lunch, and before that, a few cheers for that. <laughs>